fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Amen. God is great, amen. 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 So I just wanted to start out by asking a couple basic questions I already know the answers to. Are we living in the last days? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. How do you know we are living in the last days? Anybody? Such as? Okay, that's a good one. What else? How else do you know we are living? Yes, sir. Well, Scripture tells us that when Jesus first came, that began the end of the last days. It Absolutely. Was the end of the end of the last days. Absolutely. And I did good not to call you in. Just wanted to let you know. That. <laughs> I got it. Got it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Wars everywhere in the world. Absolutely. Wars, rumors, and wars. Would you say since 1900 that things have started to escalate more rapidly than the first almost 6,000 years? Yeah. Absolutely. Would you say in the past 10 years things have really escalated yeah. over the past since 1900? Absolutely. Yeah. It is crazy what is happening. It is crazy. So I, I want you to know just a little side note here. And I've never done this in my entire ministry. I, I do talk to my elders um, on a regular basis, and I have over the years. So last Sabbath, do we remember what my message was on? Anybody? Thank you. And that was really the start of the kickoff uh, of what... Is going to transpire hopefully within the next few weeks, the next few months, not only from me, but from our elders, also from Pastor Steve himself as well. You know, we're blessed to have him with us as well. Um, I know there will come a time that we will be able to safely say that I heard God speak to me. And that's what's coming up soon in these last days. But I frown on it right now because too many people, I believe, use God loosely and say, God told me this today. God told me that today. I, I struggle with that. I'm not saying it isn't possible, but I struggle with it. But what I do believe that God will convict us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen? Absolutely. And so when I say this, Three weeks ago, I was convicted strongly. God convicts me personally in ways that only I know when God is reaching out to me. And he will always convict me when he wants me to change up my messages, or what the topics are to be, or a series of them, etc., it may be for a season, it may be for a half year, it may be for a year, it doesn't matter. The, what matters is that we honor God by glorifying Him, by being obedient to the convictions He reveals to us. This is no exception. I've already reached out to uh, our head elder, Frida. I've already reached out to you know, Elder Craig, and I've already reached out to Pastor Steve. Three weeks ago, I was strongly convicted. That is time for me as your pastor to preach in the manner to prepare the church for the soon return of Jesus Christ. And I know you're probably saying, well, aren't you already doing that? We are. But we're taking it to a whole other level. And the reason I believe that is because, unfortunately, I believe many in our faith today are not ready to meet Jesus Christ. They are not ready for the soon return of Jesus. And then there are those group, there is this group that believes that the, the return of Jesus is upon us and is very near. But I think it's really conceivable that I think it's even before we might see Jesus 
even than that group thinks. And I like to think I'm in that one group, not the one, not the latter, but the one in the middle, because I believe the return upon is on us soon. I really believe that. I will not give you a date. I will not do that. That is not my cup of tea. But when I was convicted three weeks ago that it is now time for me to punch hard in giving the message a deeper meaning, a deeper passion, to prepare the way for the church to meet its Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And I, I talked to the elders, and they are all on board to do the same thing. You know, Sister White refers into her writings that whole churches will be saved. Amen? But she also mentions, too, that many churches will not have one saved. Think about that. You know, she made reference early on in her writings that not one in 20 is ready to meet his maker. And later in her writings, she reiterates that, and she says, not one in a hundred. I don't want that to be the case for Harrison at all. I have no desire to see that to ever happen. I am not going to accept as your pastor, the leaders of this church are not going to accept the fact that not one in 20 or one in 100 is going to be saved. Only one. It's not going to happen. If we have anything to do with it by the grace of God and with your help, because we can't do this alone, this has to be a united effort for each one of us. If we have anything to do it by the grace of God, every single person in this congregation today will be saved. Amen? I can't save you, but I can lead you to the Savior. And that's what it's all about. And that's really where we're going to go with this, moving forward. You know, with that said, I know you've often heard me say, talk about what is the purpose of the church. And what is our role that God commands us to be as a church. So let me ask you this question. In your own mind, what is the purpose of the church? Make disciples of people, absolutely. What else? You know, I've often said this. We work so hard to Bible study with people to get them into church, and then once they come in and be baptized and are belonging to the church, guess what we do? We leave them alone. Why is that? Did God tell us to stop nurturing and loving these people? Have you stopped loving and nurturing me as your pastor, as a fellow Christian? That's my point. That's where we have to be ready to keep moving forward and love unconditionally, endlessly. We can never stop. We can never waver. Listen, there are too many beautiful people out there still waiting to find Jesus Christ in Harrison and abroad. There's too many of them. And when we did our meetings late last year, the one thing exposed to me is that, oh my gosh, I've heard for many, many years, been here ten, almost 10 years now, that Harrison can't do it. They won't accept it. Our meetings proved to me that is wrong because we had buku amount of people coming faithfully for an entire week, and we're talking 60 plus people on a regular basis. That tells me they're hungry. The problem is, when the truth starts smacking them in the face, that's when they start to leave. Because it's hard. It's not easy to accept God's biblical truth. But with that said, the purpose of the church are many things, but we can never stop loving and nurturing one another, no matter how long we've been here. Amen? So, I also realized when I prepared this message last Sunday, actually I was convicted within 45 minutes of the Super Bowl and I had plans to watch the Super Bowl while well, that changed a little bit. 
I realized I have never done a topic, I never, I never done a sermon on this topic of what the purpose of the church is. By class Sabbath, I had never in my entire ministry done a message on Sapphire and Ananias, ever. Don't ask me why. I just can't answer the question. I just never have. But I want to go back to our scripture reading, please. Let's go back uh, to Acts chapter 2, verse 42, please. Let's go there. If you ask me this particular statement that, that uh, Sister Julia read for our scripture reading could be strongly considered the purpose statement of the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And I'm going to read this one from the, the NASB version. I think, Julie, did you read it from the King James? Yeah. yeah. So, this is the version of the North American Standard Bible. And it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it says, They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. What is the key word in this passage? What is it? Prayer. Prayer, okay, what else? Anybody? Continually. Continually. Don't stop. Don't cease. Continually be in these things. And that's the question we need to ask ourselves today as a church. Are we continually honoring this verse? That's what we have to determine. So according to this verse, the purpose and or the activities of the church should be the following. Teaching biblical doctrine. Are we doing that as a church? Yes. yes. I would agree. Are we providing a place of fellowship for believers? Yeah. Are we doing that? Yeah. Absolutely. Are we observing the Lord's Supper? Would you agree? We do that, right? Yes. Amen. And praying. Are we doing this? Yeah. Well, this is the one I would disagree with. This is the one that I think we are struggling with the most. It's the fourth one. Are we really praying? Yes, we are praying individually. Yes, we do have uh, small corporate prayers for individuals or things. But we are not praying continually, corporately as a church. And I have failed you in that aspect as your leader and pastor of this church. I own it. I have failed God, and I have failed each one of you because I have not allowed this to take place faithfully. And this is where my message begins today. Let us pray. I Heavenly Father God, I just hope through the blood of Jesus that you will pour out your spirit to be with me, that you will speak through me your words of hope and love and power and grace. Father God, I pray that as your words only that are spoken that you've already chosen for me to preach. I pray for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Father, to be with each one of us, to open up our hearts and our minds. To protect us with a hedge of protection from the outside world and all the chaos that's going on around us. Because we do know this is the last days, Father God. Father God, deliver us into the loving arms of your Son, Jesus. And this is his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, the church is to teach biblical doctrines. So that we can be grounded deeper in faith. Amen? Okay? I've got a lot of scripture. Now, you know I always say this every Sabbath. Take out something to write with. Take out a piece of paper to write on. I have a lot of verses today that we're going to go through. This is the first one. Or shall I say the second? Let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 14. Ephesians, chapter 4 and verse 14. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. <clears throat> Give you a moment.
Okay, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. And it says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful schemings. Is that happening today? Yes. Absolutely. I say this in no disrespect to this denomination. But when it comes to the charismatic faith, again, no disrespect, there's a lot of beautiful people in this faith. This is the only denomination that I have ever been associated with in some way, shape, or form, even my studies over the years. They change doctrine on the fly. And I say that because they have a tendency to have so many professed prophets that are always giving prophecies, this and that and everything else. I can't tell you, even in the Christian faith, around the world, that the Antichrist, I can go all the way back to Reagan when I really started paying attention. Reagan was the Antichrist. Then it changed to somebody else. Then it changed on to somebody else, and then to somebody else. Guess what? The Antichrist is still changing today in many faiths. And yet, the Word has already told us who it is. You see, it's very easy for us to get, ca get caught up with these schemes. It's very easy. Because they do it so passionately. They do it with excitement and enthusiasm. They grab your emotions and you want to get involved and you want to believe what they're saying. But scripture tells us here in Ephesians 4.14, be careful. Be rooted in our doctrines. Be rooted in the doctrines of scripture. Because that's where our doctrines are based from. They're not a man-made doctrine. You know, the church is to be a place of fellowship, amen? The place where Christians can be devoted to one another and honor one another according to Romans 12, verse 10. Let's go there for a minute. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Romans 12 and verse 10. And what does it say? It says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. This is a great verse. This is how God desires us to be towards our fellow brothers and sisters. Amen? Amen. All right. Also, we should be kind. Well, I tell you what, let's back up. We should also instruct one another. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. Let's go. Let's go to Romans chapter 15 and verse 14. Romans 15 and verse 14. In verse 14 it says, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with the knowledge, all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Again, this is important. We are to instruct. Listen, most Christians hate Matthew 18. Why do they hate Matthew 18? It's not easy going to your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ and saying, hey, can I sit down and talk with you? I'm noticing that you may be struggling with this or that. People